In this section, I'll discuss how to manage your own portfolio. I've broken this section into three parts. So in this first part, I'm going to give you a very basic overview of how we use asset allocation to construct a portfolio consistent with your objectives or the objectives of your investors. Next, we're going to discuss the indexes that we often use as benchmarks. And then in our second video, we're going to discuss the techniques that we use to measure income and capital gains for several different asset classes. Then I'll introduce or refresh your memory on several different performance metrics like the Sharpe Ratio, and then I'll introduce the Trainer Measure and yeah, somewhat introduce the Jensen's Alpha. And then finally, in our third video, I'll discuss dollar cost averaging, constant dollar plans, variable ratio plans, and I'll discuss other ways to time the market using, say, limit orders or stop loss orders or timing investment sales. All right, so as promised, in this video, we're going to discuss how to build a portfolio using asset allocation. Now, the reason we care about asset allocation is because these asset allocation plans, they're useful for us for when we want to manage individual investments. And we usually have a plan that includes several characteristics. First, we want to know what our characteristics of our investors are. So if we're managing a fund, we want to know who those investors are, how old they are, what their goals are, what re retirement plans they might have, what their risk tolerance is, etc. Next, we want to know what the objective of the overall portfolio is. Generally, we want to know, are the investment objectives of the portfolio consistent with those of our investors? Finally, we want to know what the more minute policies of the portfolio are. So do we have certain restrictions on where we can invest or in what asset classes we can invest? All of these things need to be taken into consideration when we build a portfolio using asset allocation. Now, as I said, you want to know some characteristics and the objectives of the investors in your fund. So if you're managing a fund, say a mutual fund, you want to know what the characteristics of your investors are. So you want to know, say, how wealthy they are. So in terms of net worth, so assets minus liabilities, you want to know how stable their income is, you want to know how old they are, you want to know their risk tolerance, so that might include giving them a survey or two, and then you also want to know what the current rules on taxation are, so you don't want to liquidate all of the mutual funds assets and cost your, your investors a huge tax liability. You also want to know, essentially, what your investors' goals are. So if your investors are close to retirement, you would generally want to know what level of income they are desiring. So generally, retirees or people who are very close to retirement, so in the, in the UK, these would be considered pensioners or close to pensioners, they generally want an increase in current income. However, younger investors will typically want more capital appreciation. So if you're investors are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, generally they're going to desire more capital gains than opposed, as opposed to dividends. Now, in terms of portfolio objectives, we have a couple of primary objectives. The two most common are these first two that I have up here. So first, current income and capital preservation. So a lot of funds out there, particularly the low-risk funds, are going to offer some level of ca current income. So this could be in the form of dividends or coupons on bonds. Generally, these funds are going to be relatively lower risk. So in other words, they'll have lower betas and they'll generally be investing in securities that are, let's say if it's debt, that debt's going to have a higher credit rating. If it's the equity of a company, that equity is generally going to be seen as having a, a lower cost of equity. So, for example, we're talking about Apple as opposed to, let's say, some startup tech company. Apple pays a dividend, and a lot of investors that desire dividend income or 
In other words, current income are going to be more desirous of Apple stock as opposed to the stock of, let's say, a pharmaceutical startup or some other speculative firm. Another common portfolio objective is capital growth or capital appreciation. So capital appreciation is more commonly associated with higher risk investments. So we generally consider you know, smaller stocks, stocks that are more speculative. Uh, generally, these stocks are going to have higher betas simply because there's, there's more market risk associated with them and they more market risk, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, should indicate or predict higher returns. Now, there are a lot of other considerations that we we think of when we think of policies associated with portfolios. I mean, we, we do want to manage the risk associated with the portfolio. We want to identify a good level of risk that will offer us a good level of return. And then finally, we should, if we're managing a portfolio, want to try and reduce the, the taxes that our investors are likely going to pay. So if we are, let's say, liquidating or realizing capital gains, those capital gains are going to get passed on to our shareholders. So we, we generally want to avoid uh, you know, costing our, our, our investors capital gains taxes more than we, we otherwise would. So we, we want an efficient or, in other words, a tax-efficient portfolio. Now, there are a couple of techniques by which we allocate capital to different assets. So we can allocate cash or capital toward various asset classes using a fixed weighting approach. So in this case, we would just identify the exact weights that we want to assigned to, let's say, U.S. equities versus international equities versus bonds versus, let's say, options or currencies, and then we just allocate our capital by splitting it up based on those percentages. And those percentages, as the name den denotes, are fixed. They don't change through time. Another way to engage in asset allocation is to engage in flexible weighting. So in this case, we adjust the weights through time based on our analysis of uh, economies, industries, uh, various asset classes. So let's say we, we have looked at the macroeconomic indicators that we discussed several weeks ago in the U.S., and we've determined that the U.S. is likely to see an increase in its long-term growth rate relative to what we suspected last month. Well, in that case, we might want to adjust our weight that we assign to U.S. equity as opposed to international equity upward. So that would be an example of how we engage in uh, periodic adjustment based on market analysis. So here we're, we're using those macroeconomic indicators that we discussed several weeks ago. Another technique that we can make use of in terms of asset allocation is tactical asset allocation. So here, we're again trying to time the market, and we, we generally invest when we use tactical asset allocation in stocks, bonds, and cash. And we choose our weights of those three asset classes based on our analysis of the future economic conditions of whatever economy we're talking about, and we generally want to determine whether or not we think stocks will offer higher returns now than they would have, let's say, three months ago, and we also want to take a look at whether we think that bonds are potentially undervalued or overvalued. Essentially, we want to improve as much as we can our risk-adjusted returns. Now let's take a look at an example where we have several different alternative asset allocations. So here we can get a sense of what type of holdings investors would have or funds would have if they were subject to, let's say, low risk or moderate risk or high risk. So here in this low risk portfolio, you've only got 15% of your portfolio in common stock, 45% in bonds. We know that bonds are less risky. Foreign securities are typically even more risky than common stock. And then we have a sizable portion, over one-third of our portfolio in short-term securities. So these could be T-bills, they could be money market mutual funds, they could be CDs or some other short-term asset like commercial paper. But these assets are typically seen as the least risky because there's a lower, there's really no maturity premium and these 
assets are very likely to be, uh, they're, they're very unlikely to be defaulted upon. On the other extreme, well, here we're investing 40% of our portfolio in common stocks, 30% in bonds, which are, again, less risky than common stocks, and 25% in foreign securities. I mean, if you want to talk about a, a riskier asset class than any of these others, that's going to be foreign securities. And then here we're investing less of our portfolio in, well, short-term assets. Or these could, again, be just any of the, the assets that I mentioned a few seconds ago. So here, we would expect a higher return in this third portfolio than we would in this portfolio because, quite frankly, there's low risk here. There's not going to be a high beta for these securities, and there's certainly not going to be a, a high beta with these bonds. Uh, rather, the high betas are going to come in with this third portfolio. All right, so you might be wondering, how do we actually employ asset allocation? I mean, what techniques do we use? Well, I mean, quite frankly, we use the techniques we've already talked about in this class. I mean, number one, if you remember the top-down approach where we started out using macroeconomic analysis, that's, I mean, that's going to be one of our first go-tos. I mean, we'll, we want to know what the economic outlook is in the U.S. or in other developed countries or even maybe some emerging markets. Next, we want to know we want to estimate the expected returns on various asset classes. Uh, there, I mean, we have the, the CAPM. We can also take a look at whether we believe certain asset classes or certain commodities are, are more lowly valued than they have been historically. Uh, we can also take a look at current tax law and if, let's say, the capital gains tax rate has been cut now it might be a time to cash out of our, our well, several of our securities and incur the capital gains, uh, that tax that we would have already uh, incurred regardless of when we cash out, assuming we're, we have a positive capital gains. Uh, and then also we, we do want to consider our risk tolerance or the risk tolerance of our investors in our fund or whatever uh, you know, we, we might have investors in a variety of different funds, mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds, etc. Uh, now, another thing that we often consider, and this is going to be true, I mean, this is true for your individual portfolio, as well as if you're managing a, a larger portfolio, let's say you're working for a mutual fund or a hedge fund or a pension fund, you're always going to want to regularly review your portfolio. You're essentially going to want to double check the assets in that portfolio, the weights of those assets in the portfolio, and make sure those are still appropriate. I mean, you don't want to be holding assets that have, let's say, appreciated in value to the point that maybe they started out with a 5% weight in your portfolio, but now they represent a 50% weight in your portfolio. Typically, that means that you're not getting the full benefit of diversification that you should. So what we often do is we rebalance our portfolio. So we, we sell off some of those assets that have appreciated in, in value, and we invest more in the assets that have seen a relative decrease in their weight in our, in our portfolio, which we'll, we'll discuss later on. Now, we often, there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple of time periods over which we often rebalance our portfolio. So some funds or some investors will tend to rebalance quarterly, some will rebalance semi-annually or maybe even annually. Uh, generally, you just want to regularly review your portfolio. I mean, you're not going to be rebalancing daily, though. I mean, these we are not day traders. Uh, so that's that. Uh, also, I mean, if you're a, let's say you're managing a portfolio and your portfolio is relatively, let's say, small, and by small I mean you have assets under $100,000, you might consider, rather than actually picking individual securities, to take full advantage of the diversification benefits, uh, go ahead and invest in ETFs or mutual funds. Because, as we know, those assets are going to be very well diversified. Now, if you sat through my lecture uh, in our previous section on managed funds, you know how I feel about mutual funds versus ETFs. ETFs come with lower fees than mutual funds, although ETFs are passively managed. So you might be holding, if you're investing 
your portfolio in the S&P 500 ETF, now you're diversified across at uh, 500 different securities. So it's it's very well diversified, whereas if you were just managing this portfolio of $100,000 on your own, you'd have to uh, invest that $100,000 in 500 different securities. Now, there are some other considerations we need to think of. Uh, first off, if you're managing your own portfolio, you generally want to be doing this for the long term. I mean, I've, I've mentioned several times in this course that you really don't want to be day trading. I mean, day trading is probably one of the silliest things that you can do as an investor. Quite frankly, you will never have more information than managers of hedge funds or private equity investors or uh, other investors who are far closer to the the companies whose stocks or bonds you're considering investing in. Uh, as an individual investor, definitely invest for the long term. Another factor that I need to point out is that you, in a lot of cases, in a lot of different time periods, you're going to be very tempted to deviate from your plan. So if you have, let's say, a fixed weighting for your portfolio, you know you're going to invest 30% of your assets in stocks, 50% in bonds, and then maybe 20% in money market securities. There's often that temptation to deviate from that when you think that one of those asset classes is over or let's say undervalued. Uh, I I can't stress this enough. There is plenty of academic evidence that shows that it is extremely difficult to time the market, and so you should absolutely fight that temptation to deviate from your plan. Once you set up a plan in terms of how you're going to weight your portfolio and when you rebalance, stick with that because it is very difficult for anyone, let alone an individual investor, to time the market. All right, so let's recap what we covered. First, we talked about the factors we consider when we allocate capital to various asset classes. And those those considerations are going to be the investor's objectives. So if you're managing your individual portfolio, that would be your objectives. If you're managing the portfolios of, let's say, individual investors because you're managing a mutual fund, you're going to want to consider your, your investor's objectives. Next, you're going to want to also know the, the portfolio's objectives. I mean, if you're investing, let's say, your own assets and you're considering investing in ETFs or mutual funds, you're going to want to know what the, the objective of those ETFs or mutual funds are because those might differ from your individual objectives. And then finally, you're going to want to know what your portfolio policies are. So before you invest in on your own behalf, you're going to want to know how often am I going to rebalance my portfolio, how, what asset classes am I considering, and other considerations that you would want to take into account. Now, there are several ways that you can allocate capital to various asset classes. Uh, you can allocate capital in uh, fixed weighting, you can adjust those weightings, and then you can also engage in tactical asset allocation. And then finally, as we're all aware at this point in the course, different asset classes are going to come with different risk return profiles. So you really want to consider those profiles that we've talked about throughout this class before you invest. So we know stocks or uh, stocks outperform bonds on average. Bonds, long-term bonds, typically outperform money market securities, and over some time periods, international equities actually outperform U.S. equities. So that's that, and we're going to wrap up, and I will see you on the next video.